A very warm welcome to all of you who have connected with us and uh, joined us for this very special meeting this morning. Uh, to all of you from South Africa and indeed from around the world. Um, it's, a, 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 it's a privilege and a pleasure for us to be meeting this morning with the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, uh, the Honorable Mokweng Mokweng, um, who will be sharing with us um, on uh, some reflections on the theme of justice through the lens of the Bible. Um, so welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining with us this morning. Um, Your Honor, a very special welcome to you, sir, and thank you for uh, joining with us this morning and um, being willing to continue with the arrangement that we had in place for the United Bible Society's round table, which would have taken place this week in, in Cape Town. Um, and uh, you were you had agreed to address the closing session, which would have been this morning, um, on this theme, which was the theme, would have been the theme for the week. And even though recent events and circumstances have forced us to change our plans, um, yet here yeah, we can still be together. And and uh, we are very grateful to you for being willing to to keep to that. Um, to that commitment that you had made to us. And we, we value that very highly. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I will um, just share briefly now um, some greetings from the United Bible Societies. And um, uh, we have uh, greetings from the chair of our global council and from the director general, and also from uh, the chair of our African Bible Society's affinity group. So we'll share those uh, now. It is a pleasure for me to bring greetings on behalf of the whole United Bible Society's fellowship to the board, staff, and supporters of the Bible Society of South Africa. Many of us had hoped to be in Cape Town this week to share in some of the celebrations to mark your 200th anniversary. What a great milestone to have reached. We rejoice together in God's faithfulness over these 200 years of Bible ministry in your country. It is a privilege to also be able to greet the Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa. Your Honour, I am sorry not to be meeting you in person, but I am looking forward to hearing your reflections on justice through the lens of the Bible. Here in Scotland, there is a ceremonial mace in our Parliament inscribed with the words wisdom, justice, compassion, and integrity. These are timeless values, precisely because they stem from the character of God as he is revealed to us in the Bible and ultimately in his son, Jesus Christ. I think we're all challenged by the words in Micah 6 verse 8 where in response to the question, what does the Lord require of us? The answer is to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. May the Lord himself help us to do that wherever he has called us to serve. Lord Chief Justice, I bring greetings on behalf of the United Bible Societies, serving the 244 countries with a simple cause, the Bible for everyone. We want to make the Bible affordable, accessible, and available for all those who wait. We were due to join you, and for your support, we want to thank you. The Bible Society of South Africa celebrates its 200 years of serving the people of South Africa and the southern continents of Africa. 
the Isaiah speaks of the need for justice, for us to seek to do what is right and to seek justice. Our heart and hope in a time like this is that all who seek for receiving hope will be able to receive the Bible in their heart language. This is the matter of justice too. Thank you for listening. Brother and sister and friends of, from Bible Society of South Africa, I'm happy to bring to you greetings from the Bible Society of from Africa at the chairperson. We wish to be with you, but the situation of a pandemic didn't allow us to join you to celebrate the goodness of God together. And today you are celebrating the world of year of Bible, Bible, Bible. This is the great achievement because 200 years of ministry, you don't know how much you have brought into the life of people of South Africa and the people of Africa. So it's a very great occasion to celebrate. This is the moment, moment to remember the goodness of God. So make sure, even though we are absent, but we are together with you celebrating uh, this year of Bible in South Africa. My the goodness of God be with you and uh, be with my friends, Dirk particularly. Happy celebration. Thank you. Thank you to our friends and colleagues uh, from the um, United Bible Societies uh, for sharing those very warm uh, greetings with us. As I mentioned, we would have been together in Cape Town and um, through the week we would have been looking at uh, the theme of justice through the lens of the Bible and we would have been focusing on various areas of justice, such as social justice, economic justice, and um, environmental justice and um, we would have been wrapping up then this morning uh, and again the privilege to have with us the chief justice of the republic of south africa uh, the honorable mahueng mahueng uh, eminently qualified to share on this theme of justice through the lens of the bible for those of our international guests this morning um, perhaps just a brief word of introduction to the Chief Justice, uh, well known to us here in South Africa and no doubt in many parts of the world. Uh, the Chief Justice was, was born um, uh, in the, uh, the village of Ho Mokhatla um, in the Northwest Province um, and having completed his education, uh, rose through the ranks of the legal and judicial system in South Africa uh, being appointed to the Constitutional Court uh, in 2009 and then uh, appointed as uh, Chief Justice of the Republic um, on the 8th of September 2011. Uh, now, Your Honor, we, we share one or two things. They're both born in the same year, I see, uh, and um, uh, both share the same alma mater, at least for one of your degrees. Um, and the university of which you are currently chancellor, the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, you specializing in law, but with a great interest uh, and also training in theology. And, and I specializing in theology, but having done one or two law courses uh, along the way as well. So uh, we, 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 share, we share some things in common, but I, I do believe and trust that at a very deep level we share uh, her respect for God's word, um, a love for the Lord, um, and a desire uh, to see justice um, made very real uh, in the lives of people. Um, and so for, for this theme, um, we have a framework um, uh, that I can discern through the scriptures. Um, just picking up on, on, on a few key verses, firstly from Amos chapter 5 and verse 24, let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream, through to those well-known words in Micah where we are, where we are given so clearly uh, this message that God has shown us what is good, and that is to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with him, through to 
the Gospels and, and Jesus uh, in Matthew 7 and Luke 6 saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, framing it even within the great commandment of loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Through to Paul in Romans chapter 13, let no debt remain outstanding except the debt to love one another. So justice runs like a golden thread, that theme through the whole of God's word, and not surprisingly, for God is a God of justice. Um, and there, there may be some who, who, who may wonder if the Bible and justice can even be brought together in the same sentence, because they would argue that the Bible has been used as a tool for injustice so often. It's been used as a tool for colonialism. It's been used as a, as a tool to justify apartheid in our own context. It's been used as a, as a tool or a rationalization for mistreatment of women. Um, it's been used in many ways uh, that um, it could be argued, and many do, that the Bible and justice uh, don't belong in the same sentence. And Perhaps, though, there's another side to it, and um, there's perhaps if one takes the time and the trouble to truly understand the Bible and the message of the Bible itself, uh, as opposed to the way it may have been misused and abused uh, for other ends over the years uh, by people um, uh, who, who, who perhaps have other agendas, uh, but to actually get through all of that. And just allow the Bible's message to speak to us on the theme of justice uh, and to understand that as God's word, it represents a God who is a God of justice and indeed a God of love. So we really um, are looking forward to hearing your reflections on the theme of justice through the lens of the Bible. We believe it has so much to offer us as a country and indeed us as a world, especially at these time, at this time where the coronavirus crisis has emphasized so many areas of, of injustice, um, areas of economic injustice, um, environmental justice comes to the fore as the world has, has breathed a sigh of relief uh, when we've all been locked up. Um, and, and also, of course, what's, what's coming to us from across the waters in the United States um, um, with what happened with um, uh, uh, there, uh, with the uh, acts of police uh, brutality. So justice is very much on people's minds at the moment. And God always speaks to that which is on our minds and in our, and in our lives through his living word. So, sir, um, over to you. And uh, thank you again for sharing with us. Um, and uh, maybe if I can just... Uh, uh, just with a word of prayer, um, hand over to you. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that you are a God of justice, that you are a God of love. And you thank you, we thank you, Lord, that you speak your word into our lives and into our world and into the condition of humanity at all times. Bless the Chief Justice as he shares with us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. Allow me to also just start by praying. Heavenly Father, I surrender myself, this ministration, and this meeting into your hands. Father, I believe that you've packaged something for all of us, including me. Be the one speaking, Lord for we need to hear from you now more than ever before. We need hope from you, the God of hope. We need healing in many areas of our lives from you, the healer. Father, we need all that the devil has stolen from us, even the deception about what the Bible truly represents, my God, to be restored to us. Have mercy on us, guide us, give us wisdom, Clarify the position we ought to adopt as your children, as your people, in, in our relationship with the word. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, once again, I just want to thank everybody for uh, the, the, the messages that have come through, and especially for the invitation to be part of this great meeting. Let me start by saying, uh, sharing some reflection on the bicentenary theme 
the Bible, hope for all. And then the topic I'm, um, I'm supposed to address, justice through the lens of the Bible. Why the Bible? Because Jesus Christ is the Bible. John 1, 1 tells us so. Why the Bible? The Bible has always been critical and that is why when Joshua was to take over, the Lord himself gave him Joshua 1 verse 8, an instruction in Joshua 1 8, that you can't go anywhere without the Bible. So the Bible is very critical. And Jesus Christ, when he came to earth and the devil was trying to tempt him, in Luke 4 verse 4 and Matthew 4 verse 4, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Meaning, the Bible is also at the center of any form of real justice that we can think about. Let me pay particular attention to this subject with reference to Isaiah 32, 33, I beg your pardon, verse 22. It reads, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Meaning, any government comprising as it should the three arms of government or the three arms of the state, the judiciary, parliament, or the legislature, and the executive, which is the judge, the lawgiver, and the king, represents who God really is. So you can't talk justice and take God out of the equation, if it is to be true and unadulterated justice. The second point I want to make is that the Bible kind of justice or the God kind of justice is based on several, several critical features, which are essentially about who God is. Without these features in a justice system, then we've got a problem. We've got something missing in the justice that we deserve, the justice that ought to obtain in that nation, in that society. And the first critical point is love. First John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. And Romans 13, verses 8 to 10, also basically tells us about the centrality of love in governance and in the justice system because love is the fulfillment of all the law. And when lo where love reigns, then there cannot be wrongdoing by one for the other or to the other. So love is, is central. As we administer justice as judicial officers, there must be love. What our actions must be love driven. There can be cruelty, there can be unfairness, there can be partiality where love reigns supreme. No wonder the Lord instructed us in Matthew 22, um, verses 37 to 40, not only to love him with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our might, but also to love our fellow men our fellow human beings as we love ourselves, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. You can't do yourself harm unless there's something mentally wrong with you. And therefore, if you love the other as you love yourself, you cannot be unjust to that person. And the first feature is the truth or integrity. John 14 verse six, I'm the way, the truth and the life, Jesus Christ, about whom the Bible is, is the truth. Where lies are, justice gets corrupted. But when we all tell the truth, then the God kind of justice, the Bible kind of justice will eventuate. And the third point is peace. It is the pursuit of peace with all men that must characterize the justice system. Unification, building, binding people together. We must seek to reconcile people and not to divide them even more through the justice system. That is, uh, and, and, and that also ought not to be surprising because Isaiah 9, 6 tells us that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. So if the Bible, which is the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, 
um, himself um, 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 is a, since it is about peace, if we follow this prince of peace, then, uh, then uh, true justice will eventuate. Mercy must feature prominently in the, in the kind of justice that is administered with the Bible in mind. Second Chronicles 20, 21 tells us about the, the mercies of God that endures forever. He's a God of mercies. You can't be merciless as a judge or as a magistrate. Even those that are involved in the justice system, like the police, like the prosecutors, they must be, um, they must be merciful in whatever they do. You don't, you don't beat up people. Uh, you, don't, you don't brutalize people because mercy is a critical feature of what you have to do. And also restoration. Justice, any Bible-based justice system is intended to restore that which was unjustly taken away. I was gripped by 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 6, the story of the Shunammite woman who came back and said, but my house has been taken away. My land has been taken away. The God of restoration who had restored Gehazi, who was struck by leprosy as a result of his sin, his betrayal of the gospel, his betrayal of the truth of the Bible, Gehazi was restored. Remember, lepers don't come in the presence of the kings. He was speaking to the king about the ministry of uh, Elisha precisely because he was restored into the kingdom of God. So he was an instrument that helped to restore to the Shunammite woman what she had lost. The king pronounced justice in the second Kings chapter 8, verse 6. He said, no, this woman must get back her house. She must get back her land. She must get back everything that she has lost. So restoration is all about, is part and parcel of justice. When your things have been stolen, justice demands that they must be brought back. Whether it is your gold, whether it is your money, and you've been cheated in a business transaction, whatsoever it is, our God is the God of restoration. And uh, even when we have sinned, as long as we repent, you know, Joel chapter two, verses 25 to 28, guarantees that the shame will be re removed and restoration will happen. So central to the justice system is an issue of restoration, the restoration of justice. Whenever there is a dispute, one of those involved in that dispute did not do the right thing. And the importance of justice is to normalize the situation, to restore justice so that the peace that is uh, critical to our uh, coexistence can prevail. The justice system is also to be based on generosity, not corruption. And God set the example for us, John 3, 16. He so loved that he gave. It, it is about giving. It is not about greed. The justice system is anti-corruption. It is anti-covetousness. If you look at Deuteronomy 16, verse 19, Deuteronomy 16, verse 19, it is about not, not uh, perfecting justice. It is important that we instill in the functionaries within the justice system if, if, if the Bible is to, is to be followed. If the principles of the Bible that are not really in conflict with the, uh, the principles of the law, it is important that uh, justice not be uh, perverted. And as Exodus 23 verse eight, Exodus 23 verse eight tells us, we judges are not to take bribes. Judges and magistrates are not to take bribes. The police and the prosecutors are not to take bribes. Otherwise there won't be any justice because they would, they would then have to corrupt the system and lie, destroy the evidence saw that the money that they were given or the gifts that they were given could speak instead of the justice that ought to prevail. And there is another point, you know, the, about this just Bible-based justice or looking at justice through the, through the lens of the Bible. The Lord chose to warn us in Luke 18, verses 1 to 8, Luke 18, verses 1 to 8, especially verse 6, that the mere fact that somebody is a judge, the mere fact that somebody is a magistrate, the mere fact that somebody is a police person or a prosecutor is no guarantee that justice will be administered by that person. 
because the reading of Luke 18 from verse 1 to 8 tells you that this judge was a bad judge. He was, an, verse 6 says he was an unjust judge. He was wicked. So it is possible that if we don't pray the Bible into manifestation in our justice system, in our court system, we may find people who are evil, people who don't care about others, who don't respect the rights of others, who don't care about justice, but care only about themselves and what they, what they can get out of the system, becoming justice, becoming magistrates, occupying top uh, uh, positions in the prosecuting authority and in the police. So we've got to pray for these leaders so that none of them who is bad uh, gets appointed or those that are already there, they must not stay on, they must be removed. So that true justice as commanded by the Bible can eventuate. Justice through the lens of the Bible demands, demands proper training in these critical areas. It demands competence, it also demands holiness. That is what Exodus 18, 20 to 21 is about and maybe I must read that one because I think it's, it's important. Exodus 18, verses 20 to 21. That was when Jethro observed how Moses was administering justice. And he was concerned that that system was not as efficient and effective as it ought to be. It was laborious and it may fail as a result. Exodus 18 verses 20 to 21 reads, and you shall teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, you shall provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, that's integrity for you, hating covetousness, hating bribes, hating uh, ungodly gifts, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Verse 22, and let them judge the people at all times. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto you but every small matter they shall judge. They shall bear the burden with you. What does this mean? Look at it this, this way from the beginning. It talks about judges over tens, over fifties, over hundreds, over thousands, and then Moses. In a South African context, this is what it represents. It is a structure of the justice system or the, or the court system, the judicial system in South Africa. The judges over tens are magistrates in the district court, almost in every town. The judges over the fifties are judges in the regional courts. The judges in the hundreds are the judges in the high courts and courts of equivalent status like your land claims courts, like the labor courts and, um, and the competition appeal uh, court. The judges in the thousands represent the, the, the the Supreme Court of Appeal, and uh, Moses, which is the, the ultimate authority in that structure, represent the Constitutional Court of South Africa. So the structure of the justice system is there in all its layers, but what kind of people are supposed to occupy uh, the, those positions so that true justice through the lens of the Bible can, admit, can be administered? Verse 20 tells us that they must be properly trained. They must be competent people. You don't just grab people because you like them or because you think there's a shortage here and there and put them in these critical positions because justice will be compromised. So you need well-trained people to be judges, to be magistrates, to be functionaries in the broader justice system. What else do we need? We need the people of... Um, we need people, um, verse 21 says, who are able, competent people, able people. What else do you need? You need people who fear God. I mean, even if they are unbelievers, even if they don't believe in the Bible, they must fear something. 
I always say they must at least fear the constitution. They must at least respect the oath of office that they took or the affirmation of office. They must at least respect the law. You can't find a judicial officer or a judge who is like that corrupt judge in Luke 18, who doesn't care about what the constitution says and what obligations it imposes on him or her in relation to the administration of justice. You can't have judges and magistrates, police officers and prosecutors and lawyers who break the law themselves. So they must fear God or they must fear the law. They must abide by the law. They must hate covetousness. They must hate bribes because when a gift has been given by people participating in a court case or money, justice gets blinded. What is supposed to happen gets compromised because the money will be speaking all the time. It is almost always given with a, an evil motive behind it. They want to corrupt the system. So it must be people who would rather be poor, who would rather be dismissed from their jobs rather than uh, be partial, rather than corrupt justice. People who hate covetousness. Now, then those are the people who can administer justice. But I was also struck by 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Ch 2 Chronicles chapter 19, I think from verse 5, because it also talks about the Bible kind of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of justice. Um, verse 5 says, um, oh yes, Second Chronicles, I'm sorry, I had opened the wrong. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 5, from verse 5 reads, <clears throat> Referring to King Jehoshaphat, it says, and he said judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, take heed what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Therefore, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you, Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of bribes. Verse 8, moreover in Jerusalem did Jehoshaphat appoint some of the Levites and of the priests and of the heads of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem. Verse 9, and he charged them saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. In verse 10, and whatsoever cause shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in their cities between blood and blood, between law and commandment, statutes and judgments, you shall even warn them that they trespass not against the Lord and so bring wrath upon you and upon your brethren. This do and you shall not trespass. So it is important that the fundamental justice principles that are in the Bible are embraced because there is no genuine justice system that would conflict with these principles. You cannot say that a it ought to be open to a judge to be hateful of those to whom he is supposed to administer justice. You can't say that a judge must be a liar and entertain lies as the basis or the foundation for the justice to be administered. You can't say that in the administration of justice, the judge must seek to divide people instead of reconciling them, instead of building peace through the judgment that is to be released. You can't say that in whatever judgment, even in criminal cases, Mercy must be taken out of the equation. There must be mercy. The legal principles insist on mercy being factored into the administration of justice. Restoration, whatever has been lost must be brought back. Corruption or bribery must not be um, entertained. And impartiality, fairness, equity 
must characterize us what we do and competence is central. Even if you don't believe in the Bible, at least as I said earlier on, you must believe in the constitution and the law and administer justice in line with the constitution and the law. Now, the centrality of the Bible in the administration of justice comes out clearly in the life of uh, King Solomon. You know, one would have thought that his father had taught him all that was necessary for him to be able to judge well. And I think I need to read here, First Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter 3, I'm first going to quickly read verses 9 to 12. Uh, we can't talk about the Bible and not uh, read the Bible. This is the time to read the Bible. First Kings chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. This man knew that there can't be proper justice without the Bible. There can't be proper justice without the empowerment from the God of the Bible, without guidance from the Bible. And this is what First Kings chapter 3, verses 9 to 12 says. Solomon was saying to God or asking God, give therefore your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may descend between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, your so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord and Solomon that Solomon had asked for this thing. And God said to him, unto him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, neither have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to descend justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Lo, I have given you a wise and an understanding heart so that there was none like you before neither after you shall any arise like unto you. So you need not only to study the Bible, to appreciate the principles that ought to guide you as a judge, as a judicial officer, towards the attainment of justice for all, but you also need to ask God to give you wisdom, to give you understanding to judge properly. Now, because justice is anchored on love, look at how um, after the empowerment, King Solomon was able to administer justice. According to 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 to 28, we are not going to read it in the interest of time, but this is what King Solomon did. There was a case, the first case brought before him to judge. A dispute over who the two mothers of the child was. And the Lord, I believe, inspired Solomon to realize that justice can only truly be administered when it is driven by love. Basically saying, the one who loves is the mother of the child. So test the love of these people. Central to justice is love. For you to be able to administer justice, let us just check where love is located. That is why he said, okay, bring the, the, the sword. Hold the child. Let's split the child into two. And the truth came out. Love came out. Generosity or selflessness came out. The one who was not the mother, said, yes, that is the right decision. Let a child die. The one who was the mother said, no, I would rather you give this person, this child to this woman than kill her. So love is central to justice and we must ask the Lord always to give us the wisdom, the ability to judge. Now, <clears throat> It is important though to appreciate that although the Bible and the God kind of justice is the ideal justice, it is not always possible in our different countries 
to act in line with the Bible. Why is that so? The constitution that you allow in your country is going to determine the kind of justice that you get. The laws that you allow in your nation is going to determine the kind of justice that you get because just the justice system is anchored or driven by the constitution and the laws of that country. Therefore, those who believe in the Bible cannot afford to sit idly by as constitutions are made and amended, as laws are made or amended. Because if they do, then the laws that are in conflict with the Bible will come into being. The constitution, the supreme law of every country that conflicts with the Bible will come into being. You know, on the 20th of, um, of, um, of May, I've had to, to apologize in my capacity as Chief Justice of South Africa and as a child of God to many bleeding hearts of pastors, of Christians, and even those that are not Christians. Why? Because last year, following my oath of office, following the dictates of the constitution and the laws of South Africa, I was constrained together with my colleagues to come up with a judgment that runs directly opposite the principles of God. Parents, according to the Bible, are entitled and instructed by God to administer reasonable and moderate chastisement to their children, not out of brutality, but out of the love they have for their children because children are not always at the level where you can reason with them. And Bible-believing, truly Bible-believing uh, parents do not resort to whipping or to the rod as a point of, uh, uh, part of, uh, of uh, as, 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 the, as the first option. They speak lovingly to their children. My baby, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Only as a last resort do they spank. But section 12 of our constitution and the laws of this country are structured in such a way that if you are true to your oath of office, you have no choice but to come up with a ruling that says reasonable and moderate chastisement is unconstitutional and therefore cannot continue on this, uh, in, this, in this way. Parents cannot exercise that right anymore. And Children of God were rightly very angry with me. Say, oh, this man is the chief justice. He's a Christian. He's even a pastor. But look at the abomination that he has committed. This man must have backslidden. How can he do this? Why? Well, they don't know. They don't all understand that when you take an oath of office, when you make an affirmation to uphold the constitution and to administer justice, according to the constitution, the human rights in it and all the laws in the Republic, you must mean it. You can't lie. You must be a person of integrity. You must do that which you committed yourself to do it. So when the children of God, the Bible believing children of God, allow the, by, uh, the constitution and the laws to have things in them that are contrary to the Bible. They are in effect allowing the justice that will be administered to the entirety of the country to be based on principles that are in conflict with what is in the Bible. So I had to explain to the children of God and to anybody who would ultimately come across that clip to say, look, I apologize. The Lord has commanded us to obey the Bible, to obey his word. So every time, even if I am forced by circumstances to come up with a judgment that is contrary to the Bible, in my view, I'm committing sin because sin is a failure to obey the commandments of the law. So when I'm constrained to do anything that conflicts with the Bible, according to me, it amounts to sin for which I must repent. And also, as the one privilege to be the leader of one of the three arms of the state, 
when whatever the state does, I'm doing it because I'm, by God's grace, a critical player in the running of the state of South Africa. I'm a leader of one of the arms. So whether I do it personally or not, it doesn't matter. I am to blame. I shoulder the responsibility. I dare not duck and dive for what the state does that does not accord with the word of God. In any event, if you read Daniel chapter nine from the beginning, all the way down to around verses 11, 16, you'll realize that Daniel was apologizing, was seeking forgiveness from the Lord for the sins that he may not even have been there when they were committed, for the sins that he was not part of. He said, Lord, we have sinned against you. Our fathers have sinned against you. We too have sinned against you. Forgive us. So I had to apologize. What am I saying? The constitution and the laws that we allow to govern our respective countries will determine the kind of justice that we get. Our responsibility is therefore based on the Bible to pray for divine intervention. We can't go about fighting people. No, nothing is too hard for God. That's what the Bible tells us in Genesis 18 verse 14. Nothing is too hard for God. So if we persist, praying unto God for his will to be done fully in our respective countries, in the global community, in our justice systems. This God who is able to open up the ocean for the safe passage of his children and close it up on their enemies who want to frustrate their, their destiny, who want to frustrate or corrupt their justice will answer and deal with anything that opposes what uh, the Lord wants done. This God who came through for Mordecai and Esther and the Jews, this God who came through in 2 Chronicles 20 for Jehoshaphat and the Jews will come through for us too. Let me round up by saying, being a player in the justice system is not a profession, it's not a career, it is a calling. Suitability for appointment or qualification for appointment in the justice system so that you can administer justice, true justice, as demanded of us by the Bible and by the Almighty God, requires the kind of integrity that says, I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how much power you wield. I don't care how famous you are. This is what justice demands. If I perish, I perish, but I will not compromise on justice. I thank you. May God bless you. May God prosper this wonderful work that you have been doing for so many years. Please don't give up. Please don't tire. Thank you for the opportunity. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Let me start again. Um, Your Honor, thank you so much for sharing with us, uh, both in terms of principle and, and substance in relation to the theme, but also sharing personally from your heart uh, with us, uh, helping us to understand uh, some of the um, complexities that, that you face as, um, as a man of God uh, in this position uh, to which you are appointed in our country and indeed to which we believe uh, that God has called you. Um, just a reminder of, of the reality uh, as we seek to honor God and his, the principles of his word in, in, this, in, in this which is a, is a broken world, um, of some of the complexities of that, and, uh, but, but that we do live in a state of grace. And isn't that wonderful to know that all of this is couched, um, couched and undergirded uh, the grace of God has shown to us in Jesus Christ. And uh, so we really do appreciate uh, the manner in which uh, you have shared with us and your good wishes as well for the, for the work of Bible society. I'd, just listening to you, um, I, uh, I, heard you, I heard you sharing with us uh, that, um, that love and justice are inextricably linked. Um, 
uh, in fact, you drew a very clear link in terms of uh, justice through the lens of the Bible. So justice as understood through the lens of the Bible, you drew a very a clear link between justice and love, between justice and truth, between justice and reconciliation, between justice and restoration, between justice and integrity, and between justice as impartiality. So these things which are all tied up uh, in justice uh, through the lens of the Bible. Um, also your reflections on, on the structure of the, of the judicial system in relation to some principles uh, that also derived from passages of the Bible, which you quoted, um, uh, that all of our uh, judicial officers should be properly trained and competent should fear God, and if they're not believers, at least fear the law and fear the constitution, um, and that there could be uh, no genuine judicial system that would be in conflict with the principles of the Bible. Um, and uh, linking that to, to, the, to the constitution, um, thankful we are to have, even though imperfect, um, and certainly probably no constitution would ever uh, be, be perfect, but um, as closely linked as possible to the, to the principles of the Bible. Um, so clear uh, in terms of understanding justice through, through the lens of the principles of God's word. Um, I wonder if uh, just as we close off, you know, the Bible um, can have no impact if it remains a closed book. Um, it, or if it's put in a box somewhere with a label. It's only as we open those pages and allow God's spirit to speak to us. And for these, these eternal and universal principles to imprint themselves upon our understanding and to guard our, our living, it's only as we open it and, 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 and read it uh, that this happens. And, and so perhaps that's maybe something you could just sh share with it in a moment, just in, in words of closing, just, just the importance of in this year of the Bible, as we celebrate um, the, the, the 200th anniversary of the Bible Society. And of course, Bible Society's work worldwide is committed, committed to making the Bible an open book for everyone. Um, it's to remove any barriers of access to God's word, be they language, be they special needs, be they affordability, um, uh, be they literacy or being unable to read, whatever these barriers are, we work to remove them so that God's word is an open book for everyone. That's the work of Bible society. And with it, through translation, uh, the way the Bible is produced in different formats, the way the Bible is made available even to those who can't afford it. We believe these are in themselves in a way, acts of justice, because it's ensuring equal access to God's word. And, and that's something that we really recommit ourselves to as we go forward, as Bible Society has been working in that, to that end for the last 200 years. Uh, but even all this work that we do and all this amazing support that, that people bring to this work to make it possible still uh, cannot find its fulfillment until people really open the the Bible and 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 engage with it and allow God to speak to them, um, and, and and in a sense the Bible is the only book that um, should be read backwards. Uh, in a sense, we read it through through in the light of of, of Christ, in the light of, of the New Testament, and understanding all these principles that that you have so clearly um, um, unfolded for us. So just a few thoughts perhaps from your side and encouragement maybe to, to, to our people just to engage with God's word and to, to open those Bibles and read them. Um, no, thank you very much, sir. Um, I think the first thing is to remember that Jesus Christ, the word of God personified, demonstrated abundantly to us when there was a major contest between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light in Luke 4, that with the Bible on your side, you are safe. That is why the only weapon that he actually used there was to keep on saying to the devil, it is written, 
Every time the devil came with something, it is written. Every time it is written. Why? To basically tell us as his children, you need to read this Bible. This, just as you have two or three meals per day, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the law. The Bible is the word that comes from the mouth of the law. So you dare not allow any day to pass by without you having eaten this meal. Because when it is settled in your heart, boldness and love, and everything that, uh, that defines who God is settles in your life. Whatever you do, you don't care anymore whether people are going to acknowledge your contribution or not. You don't care whether people are going to criticize you or not. You understand Matthew 6.33. You seek face the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that what others are pursuing will be added to you. But I thought I must also just read Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. Here is what I mean. Most of the time we saw professorial about the Bible. We know it from Genesis to Revelation, but we don't live the Bible. We don't do what the Bible commands of us to do. And that is the problem. It doesn't help carrying big Bibles around and being known as a pastor, a bishop or whatever. What matters is what fruits can we see based on what the Bible is about coming from you. So the challenge to me and to all of us is this. Don't allow anybody or any circumstance to make you ashamed of the Bible. I've been criticized left, right, and center even before I became chief justice. One of the major criticisms was this man is going to be evangelizing instead of um, um, uh, administering justice. This man is going to be pastoring instead of, uh, I have made it very clear. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right our national anthem has got the prayer is a prayer and uh, the preamble to our constitution has God protect South Africa, God bless our people in it. So I'm not going to be ashamed of the Bible. I'm going to preach the Bible. I'm not going to be hypocritical and hide the fact that the Bible is very important to me. So I think those of us who are privileged to had to occupy one leadership position or another. Those of us who are privileged to know the Bible, don't be ashamed of this Bible. As you boldly and confidently move about preaching the gospel and, and popularizing the Bible, making people aware of how powerful a tool the Bible is, the blessings that are here, how real they can be in, in, in all of our lives. More and more people will buy the Bible, study the Bible, read the Bible, and live according to it. I come from a background where consulting traditional doctors was the norm, so much so that my family was shocked when I said, I'm going to live by the Bible. So, and ever since I embraced this Bible, my life has been sweet. Protection has been amazing. I've moved from one level of glory to another. So the Bible is the way to go. We must not hesitate to share our Bible-based testimonies. That way, people will realize this is the only way. Oh, so this is how the Bible and the God of the Bible helped this man. I'm going to that God too. It means the Bible can really help. So let us speak with boldness, with clarity, and seize every opportunity to tell the Bible what a wonderful book this is. This is the book of life. This is the constitution of all constitutions. That's what we must do. That, that, that those that are against the Bible are very well resourced. And they have, the networks are amazing. And they are so bold, they can even insult you into fear so that you are afraid to be associated with the Bible. Don't allow them that space. Don't allow the devil to intimidate you. Don't allow the anti-Bible people and societies to intimidate you. This is the best 
thing you can ever do. Having the Bible, reading it, and living according to it. May God bless all of you who are making it possible for us to access this gem, this sweet treasure from the Lord himself. Thank you, sir. That is a, such a word of encouragement uh, to us and to our colleagues around the world uh, who are involved in this, this, this work. Um, uh, such an encouragement. And, um, and also to all of us uh, to, to understand the tremendous privilege it is to have access to God's word in this way and to read it. And, and perhaps that's a, a, a good note on which to draw to a close before we pray. Um, um, just that reminder that justice is not only the responsibility of the judicial system and the judicial officers, uh, it is first and foremost the responsibility of each one of us uh, to seek to do justly and to love mercy uh, and to walk humbly with God as we are guided by the principles of his word. Those, those beautiful um, uh, links you made of, between justice and love, justice and truth and truthfulness, justice and integrity, uh, justice and reconciliation, justice and restoration, and justice and impartiality. This is a word to all of us, and it's, it's a call to all of us to live accordingly, uh, to allow God's word to shape our lives, to be people, people of justice. And uh, no doubt, sir, that would make your job a lot easier if we were to all to live accordingly. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again. Your Honour, um, and uh, I don't know if you would like to say one closing word before before I close in prayer, and maybe offer you the opportunity to, to pray as well. Yeah. Well, let my closing word be a prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us together on the basis of your word. Father, help us and help humanity to appreciate what the Bible is. Help us, Lord God Almighty, to know that, Father, with your word in our hearts, whatever prayer we make, according to John 15, verse 7, will be answered. Lord God Almighty, help us, Lord, those that are pastors, those that are running ministries, to do that strictly according to your word and not to adulterate the Bible. Help us to appreciate that we are all too small to change the Bible because of the season or the times in which we are. This is the word for all times. Help us, Lord, not to try and amend the Bible on the basis that you did not understand. This is outdated. Lord God Almighty, help us, Lord. Strengthen this society. Empower them, bless them, release more resources to them open new doors that have been closed to them. Let them invade China, my God, with the Bible. Let them invade Russia with the Bible. Let them invade Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and all other nations where the Bible is, is either forbidden or there is limited access to the Bible. Open new doors in 2020, Father, for truly the Bible is the hope for all. Hold out this hope, spread it across the nation, heal the people, my God, in all areas where there is any form of sickness, economic, marital, or otherwise. Father, we pray, help us, Lord, to embrace the Bible indeed, to eat it every day, to treasure quiet time with you, based on the Bible on a daily basis, in the name of Jesus. Bless these, your children, mightily, and their families. Let none of them be discouraged from pursuing this godly agenda, especially now in the end times, in Jesus' name. Reward them, Father. Anoint them, Lord. Give them more wisdom and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we pray that you would bless our Chief Justice and his family. And thank you for this time that uh, we have been able to share with him. Uh, this time. And Lord, bless him in all that he does. Strengthen him, guard him, grant him wisdom Amen. from your very throne room, Lord, the wisdom that is embodied in your word and all that he does as he leads the judicial uh, system of our country, uh, as he upholds the Constitution, and indeed, Lord, as he upholds in an even deeper sense the principles of your word, which underwrite and which guide all of our living. So we pray your blessing upon him and his office. 
and we pray blessing upon uh, all the courts of our land uh, and all those involved at every level, Lord, that they may indeed be men and women of uh, competence and men and women of integrity and that they may know that which is uh, indeed uh, their true motivation uh, to see the well-being of all people uh, under, under Lord and un, un, under your um, sovereignty over all of humankind and over all of creation. Lord, bless our land, we pray. Bless our continent. Bless uh, indeed the, the peoples of the world. Um, and the Bible societies of all around the world and all that they do and, and your church in every place in every way in which your church is manifested we pray your blessing and, uh, and your strength uh, thank you Lord uh, for, this, for this time and guide us help us to be people of justice uh, people who reflect uh, the character and uh, the beauty of Christ in whose name we pray this. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. That brings our, that brings our time together to a close. Um, and um, thanks again to everyone who joined us uh, from around South Africa and from around the world. It's been very special to have this, this time together. And... Uh, uh, Your Honour, we, we will certainly keep in contact with your office as we, as we go forward. And once again, thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. God bless you too.